Good evening, and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ Winston Act Bible Class. I'm Josh, and I'll be filling in for Baxter while he takes some time off up north to recharge and study. Haven't heard from him yet, but I'll assume he's made it up there okay. Uh, I get to cheat a little bit on the ask of sending him pictures of us watching class so we can see each other because I'm getting to record class the next two weeks. Maybe I'll convince Shelby to do a cameo so you can see her at the start of next week's class, but wasn't able to convince her this week. But it's good to virtually be with you all, and I'm always excited for an opportunity to be able to share God's Word with you and for us to learn together even though we're not together physically. Um, like Baxter mentioned last week, we're going to be picking up in our study of Hebrews that we kind of have been working through piecemeal since the pandemic started last year from our Sunday morning class. Um, so we've gotten up through Hebrews chapter 7. If you want to be turning there, the verses will be on the screen. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to at least skim back through Hebrews chapters 1 through 6, just as a quick reminder of what we've been going over. Um, if you haven't, feel free to pause the video now and read through those, or you can read it after class as a good refresher. Um, but we will be in Hebrews chapter 7 tonight. But I thought we could do a quick review, since it has been a while since we studied Hebrews together. So, first of all, Hebrews starts out with a lot of descriptions on how Jesus is superior to various groups of people. And the reason that the Jews that this was likely written to needed to hear this was because you know, they'd been under the old law for so long it was hard for them to understand how someone could come along in their mind and be better than everything that they'd been doing for uh, thousands of years, potentially. And so, um, you know, Hebrews in the first couple chapters covers how Jesus is superior to the angels, how he's superior to Moses, and how he's superior to the high priests of the old law. And this is all to help the Jews who need to convert over to Christianity understand who Jesus really is and understand why the new law is better. Subsequent chapters cover how Jesus is still relatable and compassionate towards us and that perfect high priest go between translator for us even though he is better than all those things that have come before him because as you might imagine as you hear all those things it can make him seem like somebody that you can't be comfortable with and that you can't go to but that's definitely not the case because he is the perfect high priest for us so tonight we'll be focusing a lot on Melchizedek and how he parallels with Jesus in Hebrews chapter 7 um, he was previously brought up in Hebrews chapter 5 and chapter 6, but I wanted us to take a step back even farther into Genesis to take a look at the first time that Melchizedek was mentioned. So, we'll first start out by reading Genesis chapter 14, 17 through 24. And I tried to get all this on the screen, but um, and starting out, after his return from the defeat of Shedor Lomar, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything, and the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hands to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you say, I have made Abram rich, and I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshel, and Mamre take their share. So in Genesis, we kind of see the first time that Melchizedek is mentioned. He was the king of Salem, who Abram met after rescuing Lot. Melchizedek is also a priest of God. Essentially, the exchange we see here is that Abraham bless, er, Melchizedek blesses Abraham, and in return, Abraham gives him a tenth of everything he has. We see that Abraham recognizes Melchizedek's superiority as a priest here on their first encounter, which will be important as we dig into the passage tonight. I also quickly wanted to read uh, the other two passages I mentioned that we've covered previously in Hebrews. So next we'll take a look at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. 
Here it reads, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who will obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Here we see the first mention of Melchizedek regarding Jesus in the book of Hebrews. Jesus is designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This means that he's not a Levitical priest in the traditional sense that the Jews would think of priesthood, but rather a priest like Melchizedek was. This will also be important for us to keep in mind as we study through tonight. And then the last verse by way of review and just calling out where else Melchizedek is mentioned that I want us to take a look at is Hebrews chapter 6 verses 13 through 20. So we'll read that together. Hebrews 6 verses 13 through 20. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, who, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We get a couple of reminders here. First of all, how important Abraham was in the first part of this passage. He had a covenant directly with God. However, in verse 20, there's two important things for us to notice. First, that Jesus has gone on as a forerunner for us, becoming a high priest forever. This means he's consistently our high priest and will always be our high priest. So there's no one coming after him that's going to be better than him that we should be holding out waiting for. The second point is again, we see that he's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, drawing a strong contrast with the Levitical priesthood. So with all that background, let's dig in starting in chapter 7. We'll begin with verses 1 through 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, and to Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. The author of Hebrews started by going back to Genesis 14, which we read earlier, to remind the Jews of who Melchizedek was. He was the king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. We read earlier how Abraham ended up meeting him and giving him a tenth of what he had. We start to see the first important distinction that Melchizedek is special because of who he is and not because of his lineage. His name means king of righteousness and he was the king of Salem. Salem comes from the same root as Shalom and means peace. So Melchizedek is the king of righteousness and the king of peace. This is setting us up to think about Melchizedek as a parallel to Jesus who is also a king of both of those things. So then verse 3 was a little confusing to me, but it talks about him being without, or Melchizedek being without father or mother and not having beginning of days nor end of life. I read around about what people think here, but I, um, from my studies, I think the writer was driving home the point that we don't have any previous information about him. He suddenly in a, appears in an interaction with Abraham. We don't know who his parents were. We don't know where he came from or how he died. 
He seems to us to have no beginning or end. Therefore, the priesthood is perpetual in comparison that is stated that he continues as a priest forever. And this is very different than the Levitical priesthood, where priests would come along, they would pass, and a new priest would need to be appointed. And that's about Melchizedek's order is similar to Jesus, who will be our priest forever. Also, there are 11 mentions of Melchizedek in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We've talked about those before in previous uh, sermons and things like that. But the Jews would have known who he was and respected him, which is important for us to understand this chapter. If we're thinking about how they would have read it, they would have recognized his name. Let's move on to verses 4 through 10 and read those together. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 4 through 10. See how great this man was, to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi, who received the priestly office, have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these are also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham, and blessed him who had the promises, it is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestors when Melchizedek met him. So the first thing for us to notice here is that, like we read before, Abraham tithed or gave a tenth of what he had to Melchizedek. Clearly, he could tell upon meeting him that he was something special. And, you know, we know that because Abraham wasn't commanded to give him a tithe, like would have happened under the Levitical priesthood and the old law. He chose to do this. I think it's also important to notice that the chain of importance is defined here. Melchizedek is superior to Abraham because he's the one who blessed Abraham. Then we see the tribe of Levi descended from Abraham, and so Abraham is superior to them because they descended from him. So if we put those two things together, the tribe of Levi is inferior to Melchizedek, which is the point that this chunk of scripture is trying to make. The Hebrew or the Jews need to understand that Melchizedek uh, was superior to the Levitical priests so that they can understand that Jesus is superior to the Levitical priests. And this is a hard concept for them to understand, so he has to explain it in terms that they'll be able to understand. So that's what we really want to get out of those verses. Now we can continue on to Hebrews 7, verses 11 through 13. Let's read that together. Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. So, first of all, we know and we see that the Levitical priesthood wasn't perfect. It wasn't the end-all, be-all. It wasn't the you know plan for that to be in order forever. And also, you know, the order of Melchizedek wasn't the plan to be in order forever. God had a plan in place, and he follows through with it. If either of these had been what was going to exist, then Jesus wouldn't have needed to, to come at all in the first place. But we ultimately needed that perfect sacrifice to have forgiveness of our sins instead of just rolling forward of the sins that animal sacrifices accomplished. Like this passage mentions, when the priesthood changes from Levites to Jesus, it was important for the law to change along with it from the old law to the new law. And we even see that if you think about, you know, the, some of the ages that we might talk about in history of, 
you know, referred to as the patriarchal age, that might be what aligns with Melchizedek being the priest, and then the Mosaic age, when the Jews have the old law, and they're under the Levitical priesthood, and then we have Jesus as our high priest, and we're under the new law. So we see each time the law has changed along with the, the priesthood, and that's important because there are things in the law that, especially the old law, that talk about the priesthood. But all of this is a build-up to Jesus. And I think it's also important to note here that Jesus descended from the tribe of Judah and not the tribe of Levi. So he couldn't be a Levitical priest. The reason I call this out was if he had been of the tribe of Levi, it would have been really easy for the Jews to say make an extension of the existing priesthood, right? There wouldn't have been this jarring difference that ultimately disqualified Jesus from being a Levitical priest if he'd been from the tribe of Levi. I think this was very important for them to understand the stark difference and kind of break off from what they um, understood of the old law. So we'll keep going um, and read verses 15 through 19 here of chapter 7. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. Here, we see that like Melchizedek, Jesus wasn't a priest by virtue of his lineage, so it wasn't because Jesus was born in the tribe of Levi that he automatically became a priest. It was because of who Jesus was that he was able to be our high priest. And this is how it worked for Melchizedek as well, and why we see the passage that we referred to earlier about um, you know, us not knowing of his lineage or where he came from. That was important for them to understand here. Um, and we can see another reference to Melchizedek in prophecy to, about Jesus in Psalm 110. So I wanted us to read that together. Psalm 110. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nation, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the, the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Here we see in verse 4 the prophecy that the Lord won't change his mind when Jesus is sworn in his priest that I referred to earlier. In the rest of the verses, we read that the old law was set aside, or referring back to Hebrews chapter 7, um, we read that the old law was set aside because of its weakness. The weakness wasn't necessarily the law itself, but the effect of it on those who were disobedient. There was no way under the old law for us to be made whole and be reconciled with God. Our sins could only be rolled forward. However, under the new law, and with Jesus as our high priest, we can ultimately be reconciled and made complete. I'll read 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, which says, For Christ also suffered once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And so we see that Jesus can reconcile and bring us close to God because he was righteous and given us that sacrifice for us. And so that just ultimately means that things are better under the new law and his priesthood. Let's keep going to Hebrews chapter 7, verses 22 through 24. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. This priesthood is also superior to the Levitical priesthood because it was established with the Lord's oath. The Lord swore to the permanency of the priesthood of Christ. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. We read that here and back in Psalm. 
Christ is priest forever. Further, Jesus is the guarantee of this better covenant. He guarantees to men that God will fulfill his covenant of forgiveness, and he guarantees to God that those who are in him are acceptable. As we know, Jesus has a unique position between us and God that allows him to do this and allows us to trust him. He came down to earth and suffered like we do, so we know that he can advocate for us correctly. He also, um, you know, is a divine being and can talk to God for us. So he's in that unique position to be able to do this. And then another thing that I wanted to mention and why I wanted us to read the passage we did in Psalm is that this wasn't something that, you know, God kept changing course because things were going wrong. This was always a part of the plan that he had for us to be able to be reconciled to him. And so I think that's important for us to remember and was also very important for the Jews of this time to remember. Now let's finish out the chapter by reading verses 25 through 28 together. of Hebrews chapter 7. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have a high, such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered him up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. We learn how men draw near to God with what Jesus said in John 6, 44 through 45. No man can come to me except the Father that sent me draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone that hath heard from the Father and hath learned cometh to me to draw to draw near unto God is to draw near to Christ through hearing, learning, and being taught. What do we have to be taught? We have to be taught the law of Christ, what we've been talking about here. That ultimately lets us draw near to God. And then so when we're taught and we're obedient, we'll be saved by following what we're taught in the Bible, to be baptized, and to follow Jesus. And then Jesus lives on to be that intercession for us, who have been baptized, who have heard, who have learned, who have been taught, and who are following him. And so he will be that interceder for us to plead on our behalf, to act as a mediator in disputes, and he's qualified to be an intercessor, which is what we learned in Hebrews chapter 2. And so this is all very important for the Hebrew writer to keep hitting on so that the Jews will understand this and it will make their transition easier. The author also returns to the contrast of the temporal nature of those who acted as priests on behalf of pe the people under the Levitical priesthood. They could not continue their role in office because of death. However, Jesus holds the priesthood permanently because he will never die. Therefore, Jesus is able to save completely those who draw near to him because he always lives to make intercession. Remember, the theme of the book has been to not to turn back, not to give up, and not to drift away from God. This is just a reminder of that. Those who draw near to God have an advantage under the priesthood of Christ, who is always making intercession and is able to completely save. We also have a special high priest with his unique character. He is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Because of this, he does not need to offer daily sacrifices on his own behalf, like the priests of Aaron had to do. He made one offering for sins on behalf of the people because of his perfect nature, but the sacrifice was himself instead of animals. Under the Mosaic law, the priest would have to make daily sacrifices for the sins of the people. A lamb was offered in the morning and another in the evening every single day we see in Exodus and Numbers, and the high priest would offer a sin offering once a year for both himself and the people on the Day of Atonement. The point being that the high priest was no different than the rest of Israel and that he too sinned and needed to be for, uh, forgiven of those sins and have those rolled forward. Jesus, however, never committed a sin. He laid down his perfect life as a sacrifice for man's sins 
The prophet Isaiah said, As a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and as a sheep that before it shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth, in Isaiah 53, 7. The Mosaic Law appointed the sons of Aaron to be priests. These high priests would make atonement for their own sins. And so, under this system, it was not perfect and complete like Jesus' priesthood. And that was because they were also under an imperfect law, like we discussed before. So it's important for us to remember that Jesus is superior because he represents and offers perfection, sinless perfection. Sins are completely forgiven under the law, the new law that we're under, and so Jesus is superior. So, to summarize what we've looked at through this study, it's important for us to remember that Jesus was a high, is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and that's important for our understanding and the Jews of this time to understand that that's superior to the Levitical priesthood because it allows us to be reconciled and brought closer to God and to ultimately be saved and have our sins forgiven. So, we'll be picking up in Hebrews chapter 8 next week. Uh, please take some time to read through that passage before we study together. Um, feel free to post in the comments if you have any questions. But uh, we'll go ahead and close with a prayer. Um, and thank you for attending tonight. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight asking you to bless our study and help us to take these words that we've learned and from your word and to apply it to our lives and to use it to help us grow. Help us as we're um, being more separated than we usually are to stay encouraged and to continue to study your word and to check on each other and to just do whatever we can to support each other through these trying times. We ask you to be with all of those that have been affected by the various storms across the country. Please be with them. Help them rebuild and repair anything that has happened and help them to stay strong through all of that. Help our country and around the world as the pandemic continues to um, stay with us. Please, if it's your will, help the vaccine to get out and help everyone to be able to get back to spending time with each other so that we can spread your word even more help us while we're in the point that we are to use our means and our resources that you bless us with to help other people help our the leaders of our nation and nations around the world to work together for this and for other things and to follow you as closely as they can we ask you to bless the four lakes church and our mission to spread your word and just help us to stay encouraged please be with our elders as they lead us in this trying time and just be with them and encourage them and help us to listen and learn from them. We're so thankful for everything that you give us and please be with those of our congregation who are sp sick both physically and spiritually. Please be with those who are spiritually struggling to reach out for encouragement from others. Help us to go through the rest of this week and serve you to the best of our ability. In Jesus' name, amen.